I'm pleased to introduce our panel, Adam Matthews, Director Investment Team of the Church of England Pension Fund and Co-Chair of the Transition Pathway Initiative. Adam, over to you and your expert panel. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to chair a panel and probably have one of the most challenging titles <laughs> in which to stimulate a discussion in a limited time. So we've got 30 minutes to do our best to try and attempt some semblance of a coherent answer to how should central banks, governments, investors, financial markets create resilience and respond to mitigating climate, global health and inequality. And we only need 30 minutes because of the panel that we have are so highly capable. We have Florence Fontaine from BNP, Paris, um, BNP Paribas Securities. She's the head of company engagement and general secretary. We have Cherry Madeira, who is from Refinitiv, global head of industry and government affairs. And Jean-Marie Mercadel, CIO of OFI Asset Management. So all three of them will respond to um, a question and really we're gonna try and have a bit of a debate at the end of um, their initial opening remarks. There is the option to put questions to the panel and I know they're gonna be fed through to me and we'll see how we do in the next 30 minutes. And I know that I'm gonna be prompted when I need to wrap things up. So, but in terms of answering that question, just a short reflection before I turn to our panel. I think the twin stresses of climate and coronavirus have really put the question of resilience and the stability of markets, of ecosystems, of society into stark focus. It's also brought an even greater focus on the inequality that already existed within society, but is now even brought into greater, sharper relief. Our adventure solutions do not lie with any one actor or any one sector, but are multi-dimensional and multi-stakeholder and roadmaps for action are not clear at the moment, but some are emerging. They will need very different partnerships of the committed to drive the level of change that's needed if we're going to actually have a comprehensive approach to addressing these challenges. So the panel really we've been given today are experts within their respective institutions. They all have perspectives that I think can bring an insight to this. And I'm going to turn first to Florence um, to basically, if you can do a short introduction of yourself and what do you understand by resilience and transition? And then I'm wouldn't mind if you could give me a couple of suggestions of the key interventions needed to de deliver resilience. Thank you, Adam. So I, I'm Florence Fontan. I'm working for BNP Paribas Security Services, which is the first worldwide uh, largest uh, asset servicing. And it's true that both at Security Services and BNP Paribas at large, we've been very active on, on the sustainability agenda in general uh, for, for some years now. Um, on, I would say, uh, resilience, I think the ultimate goal is about making sure that you, us as human beings continue to exist in uh, 200 years uh, from now. I think that's, that's the ultimate goal that we all need to, to look after that. Um, now, it's a bit uh, very ambitious, and it's true that the financial sectors has a, has a key role to play in, in, in that context. Um, I would say the, the objective is extremely ambitious and we need to act now. And I think the COVID-19 crisis has even reinforced all those elements. So in terms of immediate next steps, uh, what I would recommend, I think um, the first one would be to continue for the uh, EU Commission, uh, for example, to continue to work on those taxonomy and to make sure that uh, indeed we continue to clarify the rules of the games for all the financial sectors. And um, clearly the, the, the next topic that they need to work on is on the social uh, taxonomy. So we've been working on the environmental, but the COVID-19 uh, has really highlighted that the social aspects and equalities is, is key on the agenda as well. The second aspect where we should be able to work on more actively, I would say, and where the financial sectors has, a, has an immediate role to play. I mean, on taxonomy, of course, we are experts in, 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 in we are contributing to that with the new um, announced uh, expert panel that the, the commission has just recently published. But the second topic is more, I would say, um, immediate products. In, I would really suggest that we develop those blended finance vehicles, so notably funds, because 
there is one aspect that we clearly identify is that there's no way the governments and the public authority will be able to finance the entire need or the, the entire uh, infrastructure needs that we need to build to achieve this climate and social challenge. So we will need to combine public and private money into that. And I think blended finance funds, for example, where you have a first, I mean, a first tranche where you put public money into that, uh, that accept a certain level of risk that will leverage and help institutional investors to, to participate to that. And here we will have a role to play to build that and to channel, to help channeling the institutional investors money as well into the sustainable agenda. I stay here because I know we have limited time. Well, no, that's, that's a tremendous opening. And I suppose a quick question back to you is in, in terms of the rules of the game, you've highlighted the taxonomy and the progress we've made with, with the environment in, in codifying that within Europe. And you say the need for a socials taxonomy. Do you think the fact that we've not developed them in parallel actually undermines the ability for us to deliver on the green taxonomy or the climate taxonomy? Because surely there's a conflict. Because if you don't bring the two together, um, yes, but you had, I mean, you had to start somewhere, okay, and I, and I, and I think that um, climate uh, was more uh, high on the agenda, the awareness was ready, um, the data aspects, the scientists uh, element were also more uh, mature, so that could work on that. Maybe we will have to adjust the green taxonomy to take into account some social aspects, but we had it to start somewhere. And better start in sequence than put everything in parallel and you never deliver something. So I, I'm very pragmatic here. Indeed, there's some adjustment. But in some areas, when you see on the ground, um, you, you find that you need to tackle social to adjust, I mean, to really tackle the environmental aspect as well. They're very interconnected. Um, so on the various projects of that. So indeed, the taxonomy will probably be adjusted, but at least we have, a, we have a, already a starting point mm -hmm. and a great one. Yeah, I, I mean, I think from, obviously, we were, we're, church, we're a church pension fund, we're acutely conscious that climate will impact the poorest of the world and will impact those that are least capable of being able to respond and adapt to it. So there is a natural social issue within addressing that subject. So I would concur with you. So I've got one last question then for you before I go to our next panelist. What role do you personally and what role does your organization have in developing those solutions and those approaches you've described? I think we, we are, um, uh, our role is in, is in many areas. I mean, in, I will just focus on security services because if I intend to the bank at large, then um, I can have a full list. But just on our side is that we have a first role to continue to assist our clients by making their way of typically what are the impact of their own portfolios okay so what is the carbon footprint of a portfolio what are the so uh, is there controversy elements etc and some investors don't necessarily know all the details into that so as an asset servicing i think we have a first element not to advise investments that's not a role but at least to push back to them what are the consequences? What is the awareness, the dashboard, the KPIs that a portfolio will have? That's one aspect. The second aspect where we can is facilitate and giving the tools to the, uh, to the institutional investors to accompany and to invest into the sustainability in, uh, elements. So th this is what? This is facilitating engagement with companies through proxy voting, ensuring that if they do securities lending that they can apply their sustainability policy they have defined to make sure that they don't receive collateral that is not adapted to their policy. So that is second aspect. And more importantly, going back to my blended finance topic that I mentioned earlier, I think we have a key element here to play to facilitate the setting up of those funds to, uh, and, and as a depository and fund administration to facilitate the fact and all the necessary reporting that are uh, so that investors can really also see that probably performance will also accompany, as, as we've seen, performance will continue to be probably higher on those sustainability funds. So it's not just an arbitrage between performance and sustainability that goes hands in hands. Brilliant. 
Well, thank you very much uh, for that, Florence. And I have to say, of all the Zoom calls I've done, you're the first to have a harp, and it's a beautiful thing to see that in the background. So uh, you get 10 out of 10 on Rim Rater, I suspect. So I'm going to now turn to our second panellist, and um, we, we have Sherry Madeira um, from Refinitiv. And um, really, same question to you, if you don't mind, in terms of what, what do you understand by resilience and transition from your perspective within your organisation? And the one or two suggestions, practical suggestions, of the interventions that are needed uh, to deliver resilience. Unmuting first, always a good start. Um, uh, thanks very much, Adam. And um, you know, I think this is a really uh, important topic. Everyone's talking about it. Um, when you think about resilience, and I think one of the things that we reflect on is it, it isn't just about E, S, and G. Um, it's really about deploying capital uh, in terms of uh, a sustainable, sustainable way, uh, not just for returns now, but returns in the future. Uh, and, and actually, you know, th those returns and those resources, the capital I'm talking about, um, has become more scarce uh, as COVID and the pandemic hits and, and the ramifications of that. So it's even more important to make sure that that idea of resilience, of climate, of, uh, of having a sustainable deployment is, is that much more important. Um, you know, Refinitiv is a data company, uh, so it's going to surprise nobody uh, that I think that actually data uh, is a really important uh, part of the success of a uh, sustainable finance strategy. And, and indeed, it's going to be at the core uh, of trying to understand how it is we can deploy capital. Um, it's that old adage, you know, what you can measure, you can manage. Uh, and, you know, getting the definitions of that data is, is really fundamental. Um, you know, you asked about some suggestions, and, and I've got three to touch on very, very briefly. Um, the first one is to think differently about data. You know, I, I mentioned, you know, it's not just about ESG, uh, and it does need to balance out. What we're seeing is that there's a huge demand for alternative data sources in order to be able to not only look at what exists today and what has been the last year, for example, worth of disclosures from some of the issuers out there, but also what does it look like going forward? How is it that you can support a transition discussion, not only look at what has been the footprint in the past? Uh, and actually what we, we founded earlier this year was the Future of Sustainable Data Alliance. And I'm really honored to be the chair of that. And what we're asking is what data sources actually don't get collected regularly and delivered to the financial community that are needed going forward. Uh, and so I think that thinking about data differently is gonna be important. Which data sets do you need to look together with? For example, geospatial data, you know, where things are in the world are, is only so useful if you don't know where the assets are as well from some of the issuers. So again, trying to think about data sets and how they might need to work together differently in the future. Second point is, is, is partner with regulators. Uh, you know, often people think about regulators as being sort of the, um, you know, those that are trying to create a compliance, create a network, create more cost into the business. But the reality is in this uh, topic, regulators are playing a really critical role. Um, not only disclosures, but thinking about taxonomies as, as Florence read, uh, mentioned earlier, you know, getting involved with understanding how it is you define these things. Because really the world uh, overall needs to be much clearer on what does good look like. Uh, and if we're moving towards a mandatory disclosure regime, if we're moving towards some stress testing that we're already seeing from some of the central banks, particularly around Europe, albeit you know, potentially put on hold a little bit because of COVID, you know, certainly this is coming uh, and it's something that is going to be fundamental to how we manage uh, deploying capital going forward. So the regulators should be a partner. I did say three things. So think differently about data, partner with regulators. And the third one is resilience doesn't have borders. Uh, so it is also really important to think about how data compares uh, in different countries, in different regions, uh, through different uh, industries, you know, a lot of money is deployed in various different securities across multilateral com multinational companies. Florence mentioned sort of the blended finance concept, which is absolutely fundamental to getting things right for a COVID-based recovery. It's also uh, fundamentally uh, part of the discussion about a just recovery and using that social element to understand how it is capital can be deployed in many asset classes across many country borders. Uh, and so I think that understanding that resilience uh, question, not only within a small market or country, but again, across those, those different areas. Um, and I think overall, really what we're trying to get to is what is the norm to deploy capital sustainably? Um, and one of the things that we always hold as a tenant is to try and adhere to the three Cs. Uh, and what that means to us is data being coherent, 
data being consistent and data being comprehensive. Brilliant. Well, that, that's a very um, comprehensive answer as well. I, 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 I suppose going back to the first of those three that you've, you've highlighted, the, the need for data, I mean, you, you have an organization such as yours, which is wedded in data. Naturally, part of your answer is going to be data, as you rightly noted. Um, but the point you make is that um, we need to think differently about it. I mean, do you feel that there is a set of data that needs to be out there that is, in effect, a global public good on disclosures that means that we can all look at transition and all these issues through a single lens so that we're all operating off that same area? And then there's nuances applied to it through all the other providers um, that can go in different directions, but actually there needs to be this core element of public good disclosure that we can all basically have confidence in. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, a super complicated question that's being asked in many different ways, many different parts of the world. Uh, you know, essentially data, you know, needs to be transparent. It needs to flow. Uh, and, you know, frankly, the, you know, the, the, the building up of the knowledge about how to use this data is still on a journey. And so the more data that we have that's being openly disclosed, and frankly, quite a lot of what is being captured out there is done by governments. Uh, it's being done by various different sources uh, that if we can pull that together, then investors uh, can be able to choose which data is going to be most material to them. Um, of course, there's gonna be guidance from a regulatory perspective in terms of what needs to be disclosed, how it is that sort of that, you know, that, that, that comment I made, which is what does good look like? Uh, but being able to draw from the raw data uh, in a consistent way is, is, is going to be a real building block. It's going to be difficult because some of those pools of data are going to have to be consistent across borders as well. They're going to be, have to be consistent across industry classes. Uh, they're going to have to get a lot more detailed than what we're seeing already, which is radio buttons. For example, does do you as an issuer or does a country or does a region have a policy? Yes, no. You know, that's going to be not good enough as we as we move through this journey. So I think there's improvements along the way, uh, but um, you know, certainly being able to have a good, solid, raw data pool is going to help all of us. Brilliant. I suppose the thing that I've had ringing in my ears for many years is we need more data. We need more data. Um, and whenever there's a problem, people say we need more data. And actually. At the same point, we do actually have a lot of data on issues like climate, um, and there's sufficient data to take action. Now, we can always have more data, um, but my sense of it is that there is definitely a very, we're in a very different place to where we were five years ago, where there's a much greater understanding and an ability for people to take action off that. But at the same time, yes, we still need to codify what that good is and progress that journey on, on data. Yeah, I, I agree. And actually, one, one of the things to bring up your point, Adam, is we have a lot more data, but do we have an, a lot more talent within the financial services industry in order to be able to manipulate that data into a decision-ready piece of information for asset managers, for pension funds, for um, banks, for insurers? You know, th that is quite a big ask. And what we've seen, we did a report with, um, with uh, OMFIF on central banking and the role of data through the ecosystem. And one of the things that came up was the need for enhanced talent within all these areas so that that raw data be, is, is able to be used and analyzed. Brilliant. Well, talking of enhanced talent, we're going to say thank you very much, Sherry. And we're now going to move over to Jean-Marie Mercadel of OFI. And um, Jean-Marie, thank you for joining us this morning. If I could ask you just very briefly to introduce yourself, but also what do you understand by resilience and transition from your perspective and, and your organization? And the one or two practical suggestions, albeit Sherry's given us three, um, that are needed really to deliver on this. So Jean-Marie. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I am the CIO of uh, Ofi Asset Management, uh, which is a French-based uh, asset management company. We have, roughly speaking, uh, around 72 billion under management, and we work mostly for big French uh, institutions. Well, uh, let's come back to uh, resilience. Uh, uh, we, we think resilience is something that lasts over time, and this is what we are, want to do with our clients, we want to build a strong and resilient portfolios for with a long-term view. Uh, but of course, in this uh, particular time, uh, because of uh, this uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, resilience uh, uh, can be adapted to uh, new thematics 
that have been uh, exacerbated by uh, by this crisis, uh, and this is the reason why I I, I could uh, talk about two major uh, kind of uh, well of new trends that can be resilient uh, when we uh, come uh, and we see uh, about this crisis. We think about about this crisis. Uh, the first one is uh, more financial, and the second one could be more uh, societal. Uh, well, the first one is about uh, easy money, easy money coming from central banks. Uh, a lot of people uh, were surprised uh, because uh, a lot of money has been poured poured in the economy to support uh, activity. Of course, it's a, it's a good thing, but a lot of people don't understand where does this money come from because uh, our countries were already uh, full of debt uh, and everybody is asking, how? What does it mean, really? So, what is the value of money, of currencies? Uh, can lead us to a more inflation to scenario, uh, or uh, we can ask about uh, our societies and uh, inequalities, and and of course we 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 could see uh, some troubles around uh, around the society because what have been made. Uh, for uh, activity, for economy, could be made for everybody. Uh, so uh, we see in recent uh, movements in our countries, in France especially, but also in the US and everywhere in the world, uh, a, a lot of uh, social uh, demands and sometimes with uh, violence. Uh, and we uh, we we we, we uh, uh, suppose that uh, uh, it would be very difficult to to give uh, obvious answer to all these uh, uh, demands uh, because we have created so much money. So we, we think, to some extent, it can uh, lead uh, governments to create uh, universal income, uh, and uh, of course. This is something really new, and that 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 leads us to think about what what is working, what what is useful to work, uh, because the, the, you have so much difference people be, be, between people who have and people who don't have, uh, uh, with zero interest rates everywhere. Uh, asset prices have been uh, uh, very high, uh, are very high and expensive now. So uh, it, it, it's very difficult to understand for everybody. Uh, to so so universal income, uh, the, the the meanings of uh, of currencies uh, and the meanings of all that uh, amount of debt. So this is the first thing to think when we want to build resilient portfolios over the long term. So probably we will increase uh, more real assets, maybe gold, uh, inflation-linked bonds, and things like that. So this is something, uh, the, first, the, the first conclusion we have to think about. The, the, the second is much more about... Uh, um, just sorry. to press you a bit on, on one of those. In terms of the first one, you, you talked about all the easy money from central banks that have been that's been made available. Do you think the right level of conditionality has been put on that by governments in lieu of the societal objectives we have for the Paris Agreement, for example? Are we extracting, are governments extracting a sufficient um, price or commitment from that money for the resilience we need in the economy to transition? Probably not enough. Uh, well, it, it's a new process, and, and in the coming months or, or, or years, uh, we, we will governments will have to be much more explicit about what they want to do with all that money uh, in terms of uh, 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 global uh, well, welfare and and what is good for environmental issues and things like that. Uh, and, uh, and this is the second point that I would I would like to to okay. stress uh, coming from uh, this uh, uh, new resilience after this crisis, uh, and and this is about of course uh, environmental issues because what have been done uh, to support the economy should be done should be possible uh, to help uh, uh, trans uh, transition. Uh, ecological transition. So uh, uh, we will have, we will see probably a lot of money poured uh, in uh, all the ESG 
funds of way of investing and things like that. So this thing, this is this was of course a trend that that, that started before the crisis, but it will be uh, this this thematic will be exacerbated uh, by the COVID nineteen. Okay, well, tremendous. So that, that's been really insightful. For, you've had three perspectives there from the panel, offering practical options ranging from, from data to um, the kind of interventions that can be made by institutions in, in, in this space. I suppose the, the question that I'm going to pick up on is, is whether we still have a tension between the language of, of the societal pressures and that inequality. And when we use terms like just transition on, on climate change, it's very much around jobs and protecting jobs and transitioning jobs, rather than perhaps the justice that needs to be served of, of the poorest or the least, the least developed. And, and how do we reconcile that? Do we, do we need to reflect more broadly on that? I don't know, Fontana, if you perhaps have a view. Um, yes, I think the... the um... It's true that uh, everyone needs transition because it's not that uh, we are not coming from a blank page. Okay, so so in that respect, transition is not necessarily a bad word or bad language because that's the reality. Where I think we should reconcile is we should not hide is what is the ambition that what is the target that we are putting ourselves for that transition. What is the end game? If indeed you are using transition just to remain, I mean, quite a protecting job, except, then you're not doing the right job. You're not doing what is expected. And I think typically when we are working on what we call the sustainable, sustainable linked bonds or sustainable linked loans, okay, where... Um, it's where you facilitate transition and it's not only for entities or, or corporates that have green assets, but it's for everyone. What we need as a, I would say as company, as banks and, and including as financial institution, uh, the investors, we need to assess what is the ambition between or behind the KPI and whether they are worse the reduced capital cost that we will provide to that. So uh, I think at the bank that just um, that just issue uh, 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 a sustainability linked uh, uh, loan with Chanel, okay, Chanel uh, luxury uh, uh, brand. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you want to look at something. Uh, they don't have necessary green assets, but the KPI and ambition yeah. that is behind is extremely good. So that is what we should we should support, both as investors or banks as financing. Okay. Well, we've got a couple of minutes left, so we haven't got long. I'm just going to ask Sherry if you've got any perspectives on on that before um, we're going to have to wrap up very shortly with a, a last remark from Jean Marie. So, Sherry. Yeah, I think so. I think possibly the you know, time horizons come into this. Uh, so when we're talking about sort of a, a just transition, a just recovery, you know, if we're talking about immediately next quarter, next twelve months. You know, there may be uh, job protections uh, that may come in and, and there are pressures there. However, I think that, you know, when you look at, for example, the EU's funds, you know, they're looking at a, you know, a longer time horizon. And so if you look at sort of protecting jobs over 10 years, I think that that should be sustainable job growth. And that does uh, influence, you know, into mm -hmm. a green economy as opposed to a brown one. Excellent. And Jean-Marie, very briefly, you've got 30 seconds. Any closing thoughts before I wrap? Well, I, I would say uh, concerning ESG uh, way of managing money, the problem will be about data, data, because uh, uh, so 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 many bullshit right now uh, in all the data. So if you want to really go make a good job in that in that field, you will have to think about which data do you use and how do you analyze it. Well, I think on the note of bullshit um, we, that you've put on the table there, we don't have more time to explore that, but I think that's an absolutely legitimate point. Really grateful to the panel for, for their thoughts here. I think there's some there's an incredible tension between the transition, um, the, 
the, the, the need to carry society with you, the role of finance in helping enable that transition and ensuring that the two don't sort of end up in conflict, which is potentially one course. There is another course. And I think those governments that are embracing it are the ones that I think really are sort of setting that conditionality into this moment. There is a chance to build back better. It's hugely challenging and finance has to play its role. You've heard from three great people that are trying to do their part challenge everybody to think of what role they can play through their institutions in supporting this transition and ensuring that we have a resilient economy that actually serves everyone's interests. So I believe I now pass over to Emma and thank you very much to the panel. Much appreciated. Adam and all your brilliant panellists, thank, thank you so much. It was really fantastic to hear those insights. So much to take out of that session. Um, I liked what Sherry had to say about resilience, uh, not having borders. Lots of talk about the use of data and how regulators can also help. So some fantastic themes to uh, continue throughout the day, I'm sure. And our next panel will be looking at future-proofing uh, business and indeed those uh, aspects of how you measure success. Um, don't forget, if you do want to find out a bit more about uh, the ESG policies of lots of the companies that are involved with Empower. You can visit lots of those in our uh, virtual exhibition. You can check out the sponsor booths there. They're on hand to tell you about their products and indeed their ESG approaches. Uh, you can tap into their expertise directly there. You just uh, need to find the sponsors and partners tab on the navigation bar uh, to find them there. Lots more information available. Now though, we're going into our break. See you in 10.